I'll, I'll need you in a second to switch to my, to my REPL. Yeah, right, uh, sorry about the delay. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Is everyone all excited to hear about demystifying type inference? Yeah. The, good, good. Uh, so good, good to see so many of you here. Uh, especially warm welcome to Paul. Is Paul here? Yeah, yeah oh, you, you've come to the front, okay. Yeah. Paul, Paul came all the way from... <laughs> Paul, Paul came all the way from Oregon just to heckle my talk. So <laughs> thank you, thank you for coming. I, ho I hope, you, hope you feel welcome. So I've, I've chosen this image of a, uh, like, like a human brain um, to sort of be my metaphor for type inference because it's, it's very much a black box. Nobody really, certainly I don't know how it works, but I'm, I'm gonna try and explain a bit about it uh, today. Um, give or take some corrections probably. I, I'm sure there's a lot of people in here who will spot issues with what I'm saying and uh, please shout out. Some people I don't need to tell. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's get started with a few examples. This, this, is, this is really basic stuff. If we write val value equals hello, the type inferencer will automatically put in effectively a, a colon string there. It knows that that's a string. That's, that's kind of what we want. If we were to write, write this list, now there's, there's a gap there. Let's see, we've got... We've got a gap here, which is, which is going to be where, where something goes, which I'll reveal in a second. The type inference is able to work out that this is actually an either, even though we don't anywhere mention either in, in, in the values we apply to that, that list factory. So that's, that's again, what we want. Um, if, we were to, if we were to write this, the compiler is able to work out that this is an exception, even though, once again, we've not mentioned exception, we've mentioned a subclass of it, and um, it's inferring this from, from the return type that we specified here. So this is all good. So I've managed to find three good things. Now, this, this doesn't work. This is still connected to my old laptop. Right. <laughs> uh, so type inference is not working so well. OK. Can anyone tell me what type is inferred in the gap there? Any val? Did you get it wrong? <laughs> get out. <laughs> What? Put them in lists. Oh, okay. I guess like, like that. Yeah. Is that. Is that good enough? That one, uh, yeah. Any vowel. I was thinking so th th this has actually flo flowed onto two lines, and there's, there's a massive gap here. Now, this is actually the same one I showed you last time, except the type, the last time was a lie. What it's actually inferring is this, product with serializable with either of int and string. This is correct. This is, this is, I mean, there are very good reasons as to why this comes out as the inferred type. But we would actually probably prefer that to be either of int and string, I think, most of the time. Another pretty simple example, if, if we've got a var, uh, we, 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 which, which we assign sum 42 to, given that we've assigned it sum of something rather than just 42, we probably may want to have the option later on to assign none to it, but we don't get that because it's, it ascribes automatically the type sum of int, so none is not a possible value for that. Um, again, there are good reasons for it, or there are reasons for it at least, and uh, we have to live with that. Okay, any guesses as to what this one is? Now, the, the, the gap is misleadingly small here. In fact, the gap is a question mark for now. Uh, ah, right, okay, so if I, if I can bring up so what, what was it? It was a uh, list of vector and a range. <laughs> so list of vector and range. So something like this. Here we go. Yeah. Now, now th 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 but the thing is, this, this, isn't, this isn't even the whole story. This is actually an infinitely recursive structural type. Uh, when I, when I say infinite, it doesn't look infinite, it does seem to terminate. That's because the compiler has a little hook which says if this looks like it's infinitely recursive, actually just, just fall back to any or something. Now some, somewhere in here there is probably an any that is um, the, 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 the compiler getting out of jail. Um, <laughs> so so that's, that is probably not what we want. I mean it might, it might do something useful, but nevertheless. Uh, last one. This, this is a, a list of the vector companion class, uh, companion object, and the list companion object. Any guesses as to what this 
What type is inferred here? It's another question mark. It is a compile error, yeah. So the type that is inferred <coughs> is not actually a supertype of the, 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 the two values it uses to work out what the supertype is. So what do we have lists? Yeah, right? yeah so, so we, get, uh, we get, in fact, two compile errors, one, one for each of the values, uh, <laughs> <laughs> neither of which is the type that it should obviously be. I mean, list of any would be a better, better type to infer than, than, than whatever this is. So there we are. Uh, it doesn't always work as we would like it to. So what are the things that, that may influence um, type inference? I mean, the, the compiler's doing it all the time. Whenever it evaluates an expression, a polymorphic expression, there is, there is a, a type there that the compiler has to work out in order to know what to do with that expression. So if you apply a parameter to, uh, to something, then that, that will influence maybe the, uh, the, the type that's in that expression. If there's an expected return type, so if, if, you are use, if you're putting an expression in a parameter position where the, 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 the type of that parameter is known, that, that becomes the expected return type, and that can influence how the expression is evaluated. If it takes an implicit, and if there exists a, a single unique implicit, if there's no implicit, it doesn't work. If, there are, if there's more than one, it won't help. But if there's a unique one, that can force it down a certain route uh, with, with, with type inference, and it can infer a type based on that. And of course, if you just write the type in, in square brackets in, in the expression, then that will, that will maybe obviously uh, very strongly influence what the type is. Maybe, maybe it, will, it, will, it will infer it into a type error. OK, types. This is just a reminder. You can sing this if you like. Uh, I'm not going to. So the nothing type's a subtype of the null pointer exception type. The null pointer exception type's a subtype of the et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, all the way down to any. I'm going to use these as examples. Um, I've color coded them to make it easier, I hope. <laughs> Maybe not easier to read. Nothing is, th that, that does say nothing at the top there. Um, in, in, in bright, bright, hot yellow down to cold red with, uh, with the any type at the bottom. Um, but I'll, I'll mainly be using, uh, as, as an example of, of, of a type hier hierarchy that's quite simple and that we're hopefully all very familiar with, runtime exception is a subtype of exception, which is a subtype of throwable. So I'll, I'll use these in a few places. So this is just a, just a quick reminder. Uh, right. Um, so parameters. If we, if we have a method called foo, which takes a single parameter, t. We can infer the type of t from the value we, we, we choose to apply to that, that method. So foo of new exception will give us uh, the, the type inferred as ex exception. Nothing, nothing clever at all there, really. If we have two parameters, what the compiler does is it needs to find a suitable t that works for both parameters. So say we had exception and error. Well, neither the type exception nor the type error would be appropriate there because it would, it would break either one of those parameters. So it, it falls back to throwable. Now, this, this shouldn't be too alien to, to most people here. And what the compiler does is it just finds the best type that, that fits, uh, fits all the parameters. Now, this is a, uh, a least upper bound or a lub. Uh, who's familiar with lubs? Good, good. So the, uh, in, our, in our type hierarchy, at the top of the hierarchy, we always have any. Any is, the, uh, any is the top type, nothing is the bottom type, and everything else fits between these two, as I've said there. And there is a diagram that is missing, unfortunately. But well, it's not that unfortunate, because it was a really terrible diagram. It was, it was a little bit larger than the, the missing image. <laughs> icon there, and it, it came from I think I think it's originally from the uh, the Scala language spec, a great source of uh, no no it's, it's, it just came from the language spec, um, great source of something, uh, inspiration possibly, um, we, which yeah we <laughs> uh, I, I, I can't I can't believe I'm trying to explain a, a diagram that's missing. It's, it's not very exciting anyway. So <laughs> imagine a diagram, an, an abstract diagram with any at the top and, and nothing at the bottom. That that's what would be there. <laughs> so, uh, say we are the compiler. We're trying to work out a, a least upper bound for, 
for, for our expression. So the first thing we want to do is find the intersection of all the supertypes of the, the, the types that are involved in that. Uh, by the way, I'll, I'll show you an example in a second. Grab the intersection of all the supertypes of the types that are, that are uh, applied as parameters in, in this expression. Uh, and we're going to ignore type parameters because that complicates things, at least for the moment. Now, if, if there are uh, supertypes that, that are implied anyway by, by the presence of, uh, of, 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 of the types in our intersection, then we can remove them because they're sort of implied anyway. And the answer, the, the, the lub, is going to be the intersection of all these types. Now, this probably doesn't make a lot of sense until I show you an example. Um, so let's, let's take, for example, we've got a list uh, of right of zero and left of two. So they, they're both, they're both um, uh, either's of integers, or uh, either of integer comma integer. But we're, we're ignoring the type parameters for now, so we can just write that the, 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 the right value, the first parameter, has these supertypes. Write either product serializable, any ref, and any. And the left second parameter has pretty much the same, except instead of right, it has left. So as I said, we find the intersection between these two lists. So we lose the right and the left. And then I said we remove the redundant supertypes. So of these, which ones can we get rid of? Any suggestions? Any ref and any. OK, so we're left with either product and serializable. And we find the intersection type of these, which leaves us with either with product with serializable, which is why we got that result before, even though we, we thought actually maybe it wasn't, uh, wasn't what we wanted. OK, so you know Scala can do multiple parameter blocks, unlike Java. And we can have a, we can have a, a type parameter. Shall I use this or shall I use the... Uh, the, the added benefit of the laser pointer is you can see how, how shaky I am. <laughs> I hoped I'd be really cold and then, then my shivers would be sort of in antiphase with my nerves. But, uh, so we've, we've got uh, FN1. This, this is the same as we saw before with, with, with creating a list, for example. FN2 takes two separate parameter blocks. And the way the compiler works is it will work out the... It will work out T for the first block without looking at the second one. It won't use any information from the, the value you've got in the second block in order to work out T. And once T is established, that's it. It's not going to change. Now, if we were to write this, function 2, the inferred type from this, it'll be a bit like that sum type I showed you at the beginning, sum of 42. It will infer right, not either. Which means that when we apply the second parameter, the second parameter block, we get a compile error because left is not a subtype of right. So that's no good. We can get around it by artificially adding this, this type description here, but it's, it's not what we want. It's not what we want to have to do. Um, so in this particular case, if, if, if this is the kind of code you want to write, don't use two parameter blocks, use one. We can also have something like this, which takes a more complicated argument involving t as the second parameter. Now, this, this can actually be useful. We're, 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 we're taking advantage of the fact that the first parameter block is done separately from the, the second, because we can, we can safely put a value in here. We put the string 42. I don't know why, but the string of 42 there. And this, this function here, we're able to just say underscore plus one. So it's a, it's a lambda. Now, nowhere have I, have I suggested that, that this is a, a, a lambda from a string to a, to a string, except this parameter here. So as soon as we, we apply the 42 here as a string, t is known to be a string. And we use that in determining what this, what this parameter here is, what, what, uh, how to understand what this plus actually represents. This is a string concatenation plus. It's not an integer or, or long addition plus, or any other kind of plus. So what's generally happening here? And th this, this was something I, I didn't really 
I, I never really thought of until I spoke to Adrian Moores uh, when I, I, as, as part of my research for this talk. I, I went out to see him in, in Switzerland and uh, asked him loads of questions about the type system. And he said, think of it as a constraint system. And there are various constraints that are um, sort of provided to the, to, the, to, the, to the solver, the type system, the, or the type inferencer. And these, these constraints come from different things like the, the expected return type, the, 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 uh, the results of implicit search, and so on. And all it does is solves an expression for a given set of constraints. Now, that's not a simple thing to do, but, but that, is, that is one way of looking at it. And we get problems if the system's over-constrained. If it's over-constrained, then there is no possible type that will, that will satisfy all of the constraints we've, we've suggested, and you get a compile error. Or if it's under-constrained, in which case the compiler will probably tell you you need to specify a type somewhere. You need to add... Or, or, or infer nothing, or, or any, or any value, yeah. Or any value. Or whatever you like. <laughs> <laughs> Pick something. Okay, little diversion here. I, I, I tweeted recently about uh, how, you can, how you can provide a default for a type parameter. Now, often you'll write some code that, that, that takes a, you'll write a method that takes a type parameter. And you'll want that method to do something useful if you don't specify the type parameter. But you'll want it to do exactly what you say if you do specify the type parameter. Now, the way to do this, uh, I'm not going to give you the code because it's... It's not long, but it'll take probably a long time to talk through. And uh, if, you, if you want to find out how to do it, uh, follow me on Twitter and check my tweets for the last couple of days. Um, the, 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 way, the way it's basically done is using implicit search and, and prioritization of implicits. And it, it, it does some, some people said it was a hack. Uh, I don't think it's any more of a hack than many other things that, that certainly I do. but. Uh, Um, yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, okay, here, here's, here's, a, here's, a, here's the, the simplest method I could come up with that, uh, that uses a default. And we want, we want a default for t. All we do is we add an implicit parameter which uh, uses this infix type, defaults to. So I'm going to say that t, our t type, defaults to string. Okay? And that means that we can say foo of apple and this... Remember, we're actually inferring the return type. It's always null, but uh, we successfully get the, the apple we wanted by specifying it there. But if we don't specify it, we get string, which, is what, which came from this default here. So if you've ever wanted a, uh, a default type parameter, um, it's about three lines of code. They're a bit hacky, uh, but they, they do work in at least some simple examples, such as the, the very useful ones I've shown you here. Another thing we might want to do, sometimes you have a method that takes two type parameters. It, it needs to take two, two type parameters because fundamentally it uses like a, a type T and a type S. But one of them you want to be specified by the user because the user is sort of controlling what the method does by virtue of specifying the type. But the other one is, is something that, that exists just because it... The, the, the method is, is polymorphic and needs to be there. So you don't, want, don't really want the user to have to specify it. So it's a bit like this. We've got this, this action method, which takes a parameter t, and we, we would normally specify s manually in order to determine which type class gets pulled in through the implicit. Does this look vaguely familiar to anyone? Yeah, I've got a few nods, so that's good. So you can rewrite that as this. First, define a class. Uh, which takes an apply method, or which has an apply method, which deals with the, uh, well, let, let's do it backwards. We deal with the, the specified type first, def action s, one type parameter, and that will create our new unapplied class. And then this will automatically, uh, as soon as you apply, as soon, as soon as you provide the t parameter, can you all see the cursor there? It's, uh, it's not, not brilliantly clear, but um, as soon as you apply the T, this method here will be invoked and the T will be inferred. So you can, I hope I've got an example, we can say action string and the, the, the T type, which is int, will be automatically inferred. 
So that's, that's one thing you can do to make, make your APIs a little bit nicer. How am I doing for time? 20 minutes. Oh, to go or? Left. Oh, excellent, okay. And I'm, yeah, about a third of the way through, good. So in, in Scala, uh, subtyping is nominal. Now what I mean by that is that it's determined by the names of, of the types, the names of the classes you define and the traits and so on. If you say something is a subtype of something else, then it is. Now, it must be structurally sound as well. You can't, you can't have, a, uh, ha have a type which has methods which just don't make sense just because you say, they, just because you say one is a subtype of the other. So given, given a couple of types, B and A, we can say B is a subtype of A if vaguely it has the same capabilities as A. What does that mean? Well, if B can be a subtype of A if all the methods of B have the same capabilities as, as A's equivalent methods, methods with the same name. So if all methods take and return compatible types, and B's methods must, ex must accept every argument that the equivalent method in A will accept. Now, subtly differently, B's method must return some value, not every value, some value that A's method could return. Now, this is the subtle difference between covariance and contravariance. Return types of methods are covariant. They vary with the type. Whereas parameter types are contravariant. They, they vary in sort of the, the opposite direction. I'll hopefully show you some examples of, of this. Who is very comfortable with covariance and contravariance and invariance? There's Dean, who was here in the, the first time I gave this talk, is still comfortable with it. So, so at the very least, by giving the talk to Dean before, I didn't, I didn't make him worse at, uh, at variance, <laughs> which was a risk. Let's have a look. Is there some water down here? There so I'm using colour coding again. Uh, covariant stuff will be purple. And contravariant stuff will be cyan. Is everyone okay with that? <laughs> <laughs> it's too late now. Uh, so I, I, will, I will also, uh, I'll also hopefully make it very obvious that, that super is a super type, sub is a subtype of, of super. This is the little symbol we use for is a, uh, is a super type of. So covariant things vary with their types. So co a, a covariant type, like list, for example, will vary in the same way that, uh, that, that the, 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 the type of the list or the type of the covariant thing varies. So because super is a super type of sub, we can therefore infer that co of super is a super type of co of sub. Now, if we change that to contra, this arrow reverses. reverses. Uh, super, contra of super, is now a subtype of contra of sub. Now, the reason is, in order to make those methods work in, in the types, in order, for the, in order for the methods to accept suitable parameters, which may be dependent on the parameter type, uh, the, 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 the parameter type there, the generic type parameter, we must, we must have those method parameters varying in a contravariant way. Otherwise, we, we, we leave open the possibility that you could call a, call a method on a type that just can't deal with that particular value. For now, we can just think of contras working in reverse. We can, we can nest these further. So co of co of super is a super type of co of co of sub. And contra of contra, now this, these two effectively cancel each other out. So you reverse it, then you reverse it again, you get back to covariance. So contra of contra of something is a covariant type. So uh, you're all following this. <laughs> we can mix them up. Contra of co of super is a subtype now, because there's one contra in there. And uh, same thing if we have co of contra of super is a subtype of co of contra of sub. Okay. That's 
it, it takes a while to get around this. So the easiest thing to do is just think whether the, the types are covariant, represented by a plus in the, in the definition, or contravariant, represented by a minus sign, and you multiply the minus signs. We, we can say that in this, this example here, this, or let's take this example here, actually. Contra of contra of super. Contra of super is covariant, sorry, is, is, is contravariant <laughs> in that particular position. Super is covariant in that position. Silence. Have you had enough of co covariance and contravariance yet? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if, if, if you haven't got it now, then um, there, there are, uh, well, there's a whole lifetime ahead of you to, to practice it. <laughs> <laughs> we also have invariance, just to make things a little bit more confusing. I'm only going to briefly mention in, invariance. That's when something's neither covariant nor contravariant. It doesn't vary. So if it doesn't, ha doesn't have a plus or a minus in the, in the definition. So one example of, a, a, of an invariant trait in, I can't remember if it's a trait or a class, but a, a type in Scala is ordering. You can, you can compare two things using an ordering, provided they are the same type. Um, we, we could argue that it's not, me, it's not really meaningful to, to compare the, the, the ordering of something and a subtype of that thing. I mean, the, the, the might be a, there might be a total ordering somehow, but um, it's, it's not something you'd normally want to do. So if, uh, if sub is a subtype of super, so same relationship as before, there is no subtyping relationship between ordering of sub and ordering of super. It might be that you can cast them, and it might be that in the case of ordering, this will actually work. But in the general case, there is no, there's, there's no relationship between ordering of sub and ordering of super. No, 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 uh, no subtyping relationship is, 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 uh, is implied, just because the parameters happen to be uh, a, a, a subtype of, or what one is a subtype of the other. Is that okay? Or at least sort of vaguely acceptable? <laughs> so uh, gi given, given ordering of exception and ordering of throw throwable, these two types are in many ways as different as int and string. They, they, are, they are, I mean, they're both orderings, but they're, 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 they're not relate, they don't have a subtyping relationship. But be careful. Because if we have a foo of t and a bar of t, and there's a relationship between the, 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 the non-generic part of the type, then we still have the relationship there between those two, provided they have the same, the same type. So that's, that's maybe a, a possible trap you could fall into, into thinking that there is always no relationship between them. We can still have that. Right. I waffled a bit before about uh, how to calculate the least upper bound. Uh, this, is, this is basically what I said before. And I said we ignore the type parameters because this is, this is a little bit more complicated. So with type parameters, we follow the procedure as we did before. We find the lab of the, of the main type. And then we look at the type parameters. And we trace the type parameters through the, through the, 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 the super types. So um, ge generally, if you, if you have a type like write of int, that, that int can be traced back to the, uh, the, 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 the second parameter of the either type that is its super trait. That's what I mean by tracing it through to, the, uh, to, to, to its parent type. And we then have to do two different things, depending on whether that type parameter in, in the definition, so in the definition of either, whether that type is covariant or contravariant. If it's covariant, we do the same thing with the type parameters. We, we find the lub, as we did previously. If it's contravariant, instead of the lub, we, found, we, we find the glub, the greatest lower bound. Uh, now, this is... This is, uh, I think, actually easier than finding the lub. You just find the intersection type. So um, it, it, it's A with B with C. You just, you just with them together. And that will give you the glub of the, uh, of the types for a contravariant parameter. And you recurse on any nested parameters. So, so if it's a complicated expression with, with deeply, deeply nested types, you use the same algorithm over and over again. Uh, 
it's, 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 a, bit, uh, it's a bit generous to call this an algorithm. It, it, it really is a sort of, this is vaguely what happens. There are details which I haven't mentioned. So one other possible thing that can, uh, can influence the, the type of an expression when you're, when you're evaluating it is the return type. The return type that's expected for the position that that, that, uh, that expression is in, in the code. Here are two methods which look very similar. They have different names and they have different return types. One returns an ordering, one returns a list. I haven't shown you the implementations because they're boring. I also don't know what they, they do, really. And, and I've, also, uh, I've also made these uh, any to, to kind of indicate that, that that type is not an interesting type. Pretend it's not there. So we can call these, these two things here, val x. These, these should look very similar, except this is using an ordering. This one's using a list. And we call the different methods here. What happens? Do both of them work? Do neither of them work? Does one of them work? One of them, one of them works. Which one? The one which isn't covariant. The one which isn't covariant. Correct. Um, so it, it would actually, yeah. Uh, first thing to note is that Scala can't infer the type of something just from a lambda. I, I kind of touched on this before where, um, where, where I had a, had a lambda which wasn't, uh, where the parameter to the lambda was not explicitly ascribed to type. Scala just doesn't know how to do that. There are, there are generally speaking, too many possible things uh, too many possible um, things that could influence what that type is. Scala could do more, more, more global analysis of, of the code that exists inside that lambda and, and, and make a guess as to what the, uh, what, the, what, what, what the type is meant to be, but it then becomes a, a horrendously complicated system as opposed to a, a mildly... No, it's not much. It, it, it is horrendously complicated either way, but it, it, it's, it's, it is yet further away from simple. So it just doesn't try and, try and infer the type of lambda unless it's got some more information. Now, with ordering, the, these are the two definitions from the Scala standard library source code on ordering and list. Uh, they differ, and that's a trait, that's a sealed abstract class, but that's not the relevant bit. It's this plus here. That is the thing that makes list different from ordering, and which means that list does not work. So if our return type is ordering, then we can say that the return values type is anything that's a subtype of ordering of t. <coughs> now, ordering is invariant, so we can say that the t must be exactly t. The t does not vary, it is invariant. So we therefore know what t is for the, for the function parameter value. So although, although invariance may seem like you haven't put the effort in to add all those, uh, add all those pluses and minuses throughout your massive hierarchy of types, <coughs> it actually gives us, uh, gives us uh, uh, an easy answer here. But in the case of list, list is covariant in its, in its parameter t. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this out. We only know that the actual t for the expression is a supertype of something which is a subtype of the expected return type. What is that saying? It's saying very little about t. We don't know anything from that. It's something which is a supertype of something which is a subtype. It could be anything. We know nothing about it. Therefore, our system is under constrained, and there is no useful information to come from, uh, fr from the expected return type to infer that, uh, that, that, that type t when used in the lambda. Is that OK? Does that make sense? Is that correct? <laughs> I had to think about that quite long and hard to, to come up with a wording that, that made some sense. I, ho I hope it's uh, at least close. Right, so uh, constraints from return types are only useful in inferring types which are in positions where, where the, the, the variance matches. So it, we have to, have to work a little bit to, to check that the, the variance does actually match. Contra, so this is, this, is, this is a return type, so return types are covariant. Contra, so T is in a contravariant position there because it's 
co of contra. Whereas the t here, well, a, a parameter is contravariant, but the parameter type here is a function. And the parameter type of a function, the first uh, type parameter, is itself contravariant. So it's contravariant of a contravariant thing, and it's covariant of that. So t is contra contra co. Multiply the, the pluses and minuses, we get that that is covariant or contravariant? Did I mess up here? I, cha I, I, I changed this several times. I don't know. <laughs> Try it. If it works, it's right. If it doesn't work, change, change that to contra and the other thing to co. This is how hard it is. Um, so we can, we can write this inferred without specifying the parameter here just by virtue of knowing the result type. Likewise, if we reverse the contra and co here, we can say this. This will be inferred, this, this type here. But if they match, we have a problem. We have to actually say this is, this is explicitly type co of int in order for it to work it out. I'm not going to ask if that's OK, because it's probably not. Try it out. So back to our list of things which, which influence type inference. Uh, the first, I, I'm, I'm going to order them this time. So the, the number one thing which will definitely influence it is, the, is explicitly specifying the type. That will guarantee that, that, it, that it is uh, that type, or at least a compile error. If, if it's not been specified explicitly, then the compiler will look at the parameters. The parameters, or the, the types of the values you apply to the, the, the method call, the types of them will, will influence potentially the, uh, the, the, the types in the expression. If there is a unique implicit, uh, that, that can also uh, influence the type. And finally, so it, it's, it's notable that this is, the, this is the last thing on the list, the expected return type. That is the last thing the compiler checks, or the type inferencer checks, to see whether it can gain anything from, um, uh, from, 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 uh, from, from, from the, well, it's the last thing that, that it is checked in order to influence the, uh, the, the type. So what can we do to take advantage of, of knowing this order of things? Well, if we're going to use the expected return type, we have to make sure there's nothing else that beats it, nothing else which in influences it. So no, uh, no implicits that are unique, no parameters in, in, in the type. If, you, uh, if you're not going to use the, the expected return type and you want to use, use implicits, make sure they're unique, or at least the, most, uh, the, the highest priority implicit in scope is, uh, is unique. And be aware that you can't infer a type in a covariant position from a covariant return type, or likewise a contravariant position from a contravariant return type. Now, all the examples I've given so far have had uh, pretty much a single, single type being inferred at any one time. Now, you can have types that take several generic parameters. And these are independently, excuse me, independently determined. So the, 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 the types of... Uh, I'll, I'll show you... Oh, yeah, can build from. Who is a fan of can build from? <laughs> Paul? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so Scarlett has this thing called can build from, which takes three parameters. And the, the two parameter, which is uh, covariant, uh, this, uh, this, this it, it, it is dealt with independently of, of the others. And, and uh, what you can do... Yeah, we've got a whole slide on can build from. Uh, this is, yeah... We have a from type, an element type, and two type. We can happily deal with the two type independently of anything that affects the LM type or the from type. Uh, what this does is it gives you a means of creating a, 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 new, uh, a new container collection from an existing one. Uh, and this is used extensively in the, uh, the, the, uh, the wonderful uh, collections library in Scala with methods like map and flat map and anything that creates a, a, a new instance of a, of a collection type. 
And if you chain several of these together, you can get a type to flow all the way from the expected return type back to the uh, back 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 to the, uh, the the earliest implicits in the so the the, the, the earliest calls in, in in a long expression or a for comprehension. So it sort of flows backwards and. I probably don't have, to, I've got nine minutes. No, I, I don't have time to, uh, to, to, to spend much longer on can build from, but there is an excellent answer on Stack Overflow by Danielle Sabral about, uh, about how can build from works. In particular, breakout. Who understands? <laughs> who, who knows what I'm talking about here? Both references? No. <laughs> Keep going. The, the, the pop reference from yeah. Breakout is. <laughs> uh, does anyone know a song called Breakout? I, I'm impressed. I'm disappointed in Paul, but I'm I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed by everyone that the Breakout, Let the Party Start, is uh, is is, is uh, from, from a song by Miley Cyrus, oh, which yeah. which which comes up whenever I search for Breakout. <laughs> yeah. That's the only reason I know, obviously. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very satisfied that actually there is nobody in the world who understands, <laughs> maybe, maybe other than me, uh, that understands. I, <laughs> I would like to meet that person if they existed. So I've, um, I, I've, I've glossed over quite a few things uh, that are related to type inference that. Um, I, well, I just didn't have time for it. It says eight minutes there, but I'll, I'll answer some questions, which I probably won't know the answer to. But um, overloading, overloading can, uh, can, can really limit the capabilities of type inference. Uh, it makes things more complicated for the, the, the typer. Weak conformance. This is kind of a, a, a nice little hack that the compiler does to, to work out that, um, for example, a float is a bit like a double. It's not a subtype, but it's a bit like it. And uh, this, this is used um, to make a few quite simple expressions work as you might expect them, but doesn't really scale to larger, larger things. Um, it, it really does just confuse things a bit. Uh, Path-dependent types I haven't talked about at all. They are um, they're probably one area that, that you maybe find that as soon as you start using them, Stuff doesn't work or doesn't get inferred as, as you would as you would expect it to. There are reasons for that. Um, I, I had to cut a load of material on, uh, on on why that is. Unfortunately, either that or I just didn't write it. Uh, F-banded polymorphism. Who's familiar with that? Few people. Um, you've, you've maybe seen it in other people's code. Uh, F-banded polymorphism is polymorphism is is a way of I, I guess. Oh, oh, okay. So there, there is a, there is a talk coming up. On, <laughs> there is a talk coming up on f banding. So uh, all, all I will say is that f f banded polymorphism is, is is a way of uh, having like a, a type that is sort of both contravariant and covariant in a, in a class. And it's kind of a, a if if you if you have that, it, it's kind of a it's a get out of jail free card and a well get out of jail and walk straight into purgatory card. <laughs> the the. <laughs> um, and of course, Scala has both type parameters and type members, which probably seem very similar most of the time, until you, until you sort of expect your type members to be inferred in the same way that your type parameters are, or, your, uh, or, or being able to refer to type parameters by name, as you can with, with type members. They each have their pros and cons, and, and, and they're, they're basically implemented in the same way, but one is, one is heavily biased towards specifying it all the time. Type parameters, you're kind of forced by the compiler to always specify them in, in, in any place you specify the type of something. Whereas a type parameter, your, the, the, the syntax is biased to not bothering to mention them. And that is kind of the reason why you end up with them appearing to be two different things that don't, don't work quite as well as each other. That's, uh, that's all I've got. I've, I've got five minutes for questions. Uh, like I said, I won't. I probably won't know the answer. This is about the limit of my understanding, uh, or beyond it. Uh, I, I can't. 
Is that, no, it's not a, yeah, okay, Paul, what is it? Oh, oh, yeah, 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 go on, go on. Uh, you might also mention Contrera variance, which I expected to as a variance that I was already back there on earlier, and also finality uh, in that singleton type. You finality, did you say? Yeah, you didn't mention singleton type, but, but the finality of something influences whether it will be inferred as a constant type or just as a singleton to actually... Ah, so I, I'll, I'll tell you a story about this, actually. I, I, I gave this talk in London in December, and... Um, the, uh, the, the night before I had, I said, I would have dinner with Martin Odersky, and uh, I asked him, does, does the finality of a, of, of a class have any influence on, on type inference? He said, uh, I don't think so. Class? Well, uh, oh, of a class. Not of class. Okay, so he, he's, he's correct there. Remember. Yeah. Anyway, I, I, over, over dinner, it was um, uh, myself, uh, Martin, and, and Bill was there. You, you around, Bill? Yeah, so, so Bill can verify the story is true. I, 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 I said to Martin, I went, uh, so, so Martin, why, why is it that uh, when, when you type, whatever it was, list of, I think I said list of vector and uh, I think maybe, maybe I said this. So what, why, why does list of vector and, uh, and list of, uh, sorry, list, list of vector of int and uh, list of int give you this, horrendous type. And I, oh, that was, uh, whoa, 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 I didn't think it was that bad. Okay. This, 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 this changes between different minor versions of Scala all the time. Yeah. I, 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 I said to Martin, what, I, got, I got my laptop out and said, why, why does it do this? And, and, and I, I sort of hit return and this really nice, concise little type came up. And I was like, oh, well, that's, that's, uh, that's taken the wind out of my, uh, my sails. So, um, but then, then Martin said, Oh, hold on, you can, and he, he sort of hacked around for about five minutes and said, oh, I've got another example, which is the example using vector and range. So he was very satisfied that he found a way of inferring this horrendous type. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the whole the greatness of the type is not appreciated when you know that abstract seek is a private type, which you can't reference. So if you try to write this type, you can't, because it says, well, there's no such type as that, man. You don't have access. It infers types that you have no access to. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think you probably shouldn't have access to it, should you? I mean, it's, it's probably f for the best. <laughs> you don't have access. I'm not sure it's for the best that you can then infer. <laughs> um, any other questions for me or Paul? <laughs> uh, yeah, guy at the front. Yeah, so, so you remember the example you gave with, with uh, either. Um, yeah. Ah, right. Um, no, because they come from case classes. So because right and left are case classes, and case classes can't inherit from one another, so either can't be a case class, it doesn't therefore extend from serializable and product. So you know, Is it? Your love, you could have product and serializable as either a parent so that they wouldn't turn up. Right. Like Can you do that? I tried to do that and it didn't work. You can show me later. Okay. Yeah. Unless we're talking about something different. Oh, oh, right. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I can't modify either. That's the. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so were, were I to, were I to fork the compiler, then maybe I could. Uh, uh, guy in purple. Yeah, you. It's out of scope. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, carry on. I don't know the answer, but. Way, way out of scope. <laughs> um, there are probably people here who can answer that. Um, but uh, I've got 20 seconds left. I will probably round up there. So uh, thanks for coming, everyone.